Funding for To the Contrary provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation, committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Colcom Foundation, the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, and by the Charles A. Fruoff Foundation. This week on To the Contrary. Major progress on the fight to end sexual assault in the military. Historic firsts and new rights for transgender workers. Behind the headlines, why do women-owned businesses only land 4% of government contracts? Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, is an end to rampant sexual assault in the military in sight? New York Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillibrand is leading the fight to change the way the military prosecutes sexual assault crimes. This week, she picked up some key but unlikely endorsements from Republican senators and Tea Party favorites Rand Paul of Kentucky and Ted Cruz of Texas. She wants to take the decision whether to prosecute someone out of the hands of that soldier's superior officers or chain of command. She wants to place that power in the hands of trained military prosecutors who she says can be more objective. It's a trained military prosecutor within the JAG Corps who does not report to the chain of command. They report directly to the Secretary of the Services. So it's independent and there can be no command influence. Critics say the legislation strips commanders of their authority. Gillibrand disagrees. He's the one who's responsible to make sure those rapes and assaults don't happen. He's the one who's responsible to set the command climate. He's the one who's responsible for good order and discipline. He's the one responsible to make sure there is no retaliation. The responsibility we're giving to these trained military prosecutors is just to make one legal decision. Is there enough evidence to go to trial? And that takes legal training. It takes prosecutorial discretion. And so I believe that objective review will be fair both to the victim and the defendant. So, Dr. Avis Jones de Weaver, will Gillibrand's proposal bring down these ridiculously high rates of sexual assault in the military? I think it will. I mean, clearly what's going on now is not working. And I think really taking this power out of the chain of the command makes sense. It's really a common sense solution to a very disturbing problem. I think the odds are in favor of it working. Uh, there's, it's clear that it hasn't worked up until now with the system we have. So we do have to do something about changing it. The current system has brought 26,000 allegations of sexual assault just last year. It is not working, and so let's hope this does. Sexual assault is a despicable crime, and Congress is right to pay more attention to it. But it needs to do so in a way that won't uh, work around the problem, but actually get to the basis of the problem. Well, but so you say not take it out of the chain of command. The military justice system depends very much on that command structure, and to take this kind of a crime out of that could actually disserve the cause of justice, delay it, deny it. What we need to do is see Congress insist that the military create a, a JAG uh, uh, career track that would make sure there is adequate expertise in the prosecution and defense of these kinds of cases. But isn't that sort of what she's doing? I mean, she's, try she's not taking it out of the military. She's taking it out of the chain of command and putting it in the hands of specially trained military JAG prosecutors. But taking it out of that command structure could be a disservice. That's the part. Well, I can't imagine it getting any worse than it is, unfortunately. You know, we're down to 300 cases last year with these 26,000 allegations. To me, it, it's so much like the Catholic Church, you know, trying to police within itself and, and being unable to do so because of just what the senator outlined in that interview, that it, there's an inherent conflict of interest. These commanders don't want to 
you know, it might hurt their career if they have these problems within their unit. And so it is a conflict of interest for them. And apropos of nothing, I've been meaning to say welcome back to you, Megan, as a regular. We missed you for four years when you were in Switzerland. Oh, it is so, so good to be here. <laughs> Thank you. So no, I, I agree. I, I think that we, whatever the setup is, at least she has, so the senator has opened up the conversation about, you know, this system has not worked. I remember meeting with the late uh, Congresswoman Tilly Fowler when she was investigating. She was commissioned by the military to inv investigate all the rape cases that went on uh, at the Air Force Academy and, and what happened. In 2003. 2003, and she came up with a long list of recommendations, which unfortunately really have not. So I do think we need a separate forum, whether it's within the structure or something, but I think that the conversation and the bipartisan support that we're getting mm -hmm. hopefully will, will address the issue. And it is encouraging to see that now we have more people who have signed on to co-sponsor this bill. I think that the prospects are very good. Some people who might, have, might be saying, well, maybe some people are doing this because they have presidential ambitions, but whatever the ambitions are, the bottom line is that these women need to be protected, and both sides of the aisle, I think, need to come together to make sure that happens. Well, and all one has to do is see the, the, the film, The Invisible War. I, I don't know if anybody here has seen it, but and listen to these moving accounts of these 18-year-old girls go to serve their country, get raped by the first commander, passed around to other people, have their minds completely destroyed, quite frankly, continue to serve and get out and their emotional wrecks. And quite frankly, in addition to that, Senator Gillibrand told me this week when I interviewed her that women are only less than half of the sexual assaults are women. Yeah. Most of them are men. And I actually think if this were better known, there might be more action uh, against sexual assault in the military? Well, you know, uh, that is what Gillibrand has been doing. She has been going to each of these offices with one of these victims, men and women, who have been through this. And I love seeing, you know, we all thought we were going to see it on the immigration bill. Some of us thought we'd see it on some budget issues. But it is on this amendment mm -hmm. that we are finally now seeing Republicans and Democrats, men, women, people from many different regions coming together because of this visceral response that you clearly had to this movie that these senators are having listening to their constituents who are out there serving our country and we want to have their back because we're Americans and I love seeing us all come together. I, I do think that uh, the whole issue as it relates to men in the military and how the kinds of assaults that they're, they're reluctant to tell, you know, their, their supervisors to take, uh, take it up the ranks. So an independent, at a minimum, getting some sort of, of advice, of counseling, some sort of support that would be anonymous. And I think that would certainly help, help the process and bring this other half of it out into the, the public. But maybe to your point, Jennifer, so a guy is attacked and raped by another guy in the military. He doesn't go to his commander. He goes to the outside prosecutor, and yet he's still exposed because his commander doesn't know to the person who's been assaulting him, right? Well, and, and, and what's the downside there? So the military justice system is a very unique one, but it's made for the needs of the military and its deployments, and therefore it's about bringing swift justice and clear justice. And because of that, the, the JAG Corps is adept at, at handling that. The trouble is the, the JAG Corps is, is rotated through their, uh, their assignment so much that they never develop that prosecutorial expertise. And so we need to make sure that's what Congress could do, is to require JAG to develop that kind of expertise, make sure they're creating career tracks that would develop that. You could also insist that the command structures uh, have more transparency about the kinds of appeals that are going on and that are raising questions right now. So insisting on those things, I think that's a better approach than trying to uh, take, take, a, take a page out of the military justice system and assign it somewhere else. That may end up not serving well uh, those who are in need because of these terrible crimes. But a lot of people have pointed out that other uh, military institutions around the world have implemented all, exactly what the senator is proposing to implement here in America and that it seems to work well else, work well elsewhere. If it seems to work well in other countries around the world that are friends of ours, doesn't it make logical sense that it could work well here to, as well? Yeah, Britain and Israel, which both of which have, you know, very good, very you know, high up there, well-trained uh, militaries. Let us know what you think. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Herbe. From sexual assault to transgender civil rights. An historic win for transgender workers. As two federal agencies agree, they have job protection under Title VII.
the Justice Department recently ruled in favor of a transgender woman, Mia Macy. She had applied to work for a federal contractor supporting the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. After being told she'd get a job, Macy, who identified as a man at the time, explained he'd be transitioning from male to female. Macy was told the job was eliminated, but found out later it was offered to someone else. The Justice Department agreed that ATF violated Macy's civil rights by discriminating against her due to her transgender status. The ruling stems from a legal decision last year by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission finding that transgender discrimination is covered by the ban on sex discrimination in Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So, Carrie, you chaired the EEOC. Um, how historic is this decision by the Justice Department following on the decision by the EEOC? I mean, is this the first time we've seen a federal agency recognize that transgender people have rights to uh, un, in employment law? This is, <clears throat> this is quite historic, but it's also very consistent with the direction that uh, both the EEOC, the Supreme Court, and other courts, in fact, four courts uh, around the nation have ruled that individuals who are uh, treated unfavorably because they're transgender constitutes sex discrimination. And this particular case was a no-brainer. This person applied, got selected. Once the position was offered, she said, by the way, I'm going through this transition. And all of a sudden, the position has gotten eliminated. So, you know, that to me was very clear that it would, if we were to go to the Supreme Court, my sense would be that the litmus test being any unfavorable treatment on the basis of, of sex. And so it was clear that, uh, that that would be the case. However, you know, as it relates to marriage and some other things, it would not apply. It would clearly exclusively apply under Title VII as it relates to employment. Well, how long do we think this is going to take to percolate up to the Supreme Court? Which, by the way, in the, in the quite recent pair of decisions on um, gay marriage said that these, the, the marriage right did not apply and it had not been decided about whether any of these rights should apply to uh, LGBT um, who, who uh, are discriminated against in housing or employment. Well, I, I think this is a concerning trend. I think it's, it's a conscientious employer would want to take into account how a cross-dressing man or a man who thinks that he has a woman trapped in his body using a woman's restroom would affect the morale of his female employees. A conscientious employer in a workplace that serves children would want to take into account how a cross-dressing adult would affect the role model issue for children. These are serious things that conscientious employers would want to take into account. Uh, the federal government should not get in the way of those kinds of considerations. So the federal government should not get in the way of discrimination is what I hear you saying. Uh, the fact of the matter is this was a person who was, tra who was transitioning from male to female. This is a transgendered female that we're talking about now. So, you know, it's really not correct to sort of characterize her as a man in woman's clothing. clothing. This is a woman. He is, she is living life as a woman. And in fact, that job did not disappear as they told her. They just hired someone else to do it. And when that was disclosed to her, that's when she filed suit. And rightfully, she won. And thankfully, the ATF was going to have to pay her back pay plus interest plus all these other sort of um, damages. So I think that they are setting a very stern and very strong tone that discrimination in any flavor, be it by race, be it by gender, be it against, LG, be it against the LGBT community, is not acceptable. And this accepts... Uh, this affects the culture of business in general and the workplace. Our family business had a great mechanic who went through a gender change on the job. And, uh, you know, we had some of those concerns. What is this going to do to the workplace? What it's gonna, what, how the, will our workforce accept this? And we were very happy to see that, that this um, woman who we hired, who went through the transition and became a man, got so much support from people who knew her well and respected her ability to do the job. Uh, I was always so happy we had a woman mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> you were sorry to lose her. <laughs> but, but it you know, really made us feel good about the culture that we had created in the business because uh, 
it went very well. There are clearly sensitivities around the issues, and I've seen it, you know, they, I think in the private sector, which will now have to follow this EEOC decision. Well, and, and most important, let's, it wasn't, there was recently a, a school case. So, I mean, there are special sensitivities there. What do you, I mean, what, what are little kids supposed to do? Well, that's right, and I and I do think there are sensitivities, and I do think that uh, we have to tap into the, the the supportive as well as the creative approach. I mean, a lot of employers have provided some accommodations while the transitioning is taking place because you don't quite look like a woman or you don't quite look like a man, and so there's a lot of gender confusion among the those not going through the process. So I do think there has to be some sort of you know sensitive accommodation of of those things, but it's clear to me that uh, you know. As it relates to the, the direction, and we just had that Anderson Cooper story about Christopher, who was in Afghanistan, going into Christine, and 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 still the sensitivities around that. So those have those have to be addressed. Right. But, but let me ask you quickly: the four cases in the circuits mm -hmm. were they all supportive of? Uh, yes, they they were all in they're favor all. of and of no discrimination. They they found that any kind of treatment based on favorable treatment based on sex constituted sex discrimination under Title VII. So if if we move further towards this uh, coercing businesses to disregard transgender issues, what we're saying it, can we not say the truth anymore? That sex is a biological reality, and that people can observe that in their the way that they build a workplace. That's appropriate. It, Paul McHugh was for a quarter century the chief psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins, and what they found out they actually stopped doing sex change operations at Johns Hopkins during his tenure because what they found was that all those problems that uh, the man wanting to change to the woman through sex change operation had psychologically proved to get no better after the operation. So they actually stopped doing the sex change operation and took more care to deal with the mental health issues. So let's even think about how we are serving those who are the subject of this conversation. All right. Tell us what you think, please. Behind the headlines, women-owned businesses. The term certification is enough to put anyone to sleep, but it's critically important to help women-owned businesses grow, and here's why. Two small women-owned firms were looking to expand, one in construction and one in robotics production. But in order to land contracts with larger companies and the federal government, they had to be certified. That's where the Women's Business Enterprise National Council comes in. The council, referred to as WeBank, is the governing body that certifies a business as truly woman-owned. We certify for both the corporate marketplace as well as for the government marketplace, and we also provide opportunities for those parties to come together in which to do business. What they're looking to do is to integrate women-owned businesses into their supply chains. And so they're looking to ensure that those are, in fact, women-owned, operated, and controlled businesses. But neither the government nor private industry has done a great job. In 1994, former President Clinton set a goal that 5% of lucrative government contracts should go to women-owned businesses. Almost two decades later, that figure is at a mere four percent. WeBank not only certifies these companies, it teaches up-and-coming women business owners to become bigger players in non-traditional fields. It's hard to plan out your products, uh, plan out how to sell to women if you don't involve them in the process. Nine years ago, Lily Sarikas had a workforce of two and wanted more corporate contacts. Today, she runs two plants that use robots to package consumer goods for corporate giants such as Coca-Cola, which, in fact, suggested she have the business certified by WeBank. The biggest advantage WeBank gives us is marketplace access. When they put on their events throughout the year and they're teaming us together with Fortune 500 companies, they are affording me the opportunity to meet with procurement people and decision makers who are actually in a position to hire us. Two sisters, Sidalia Luis Akbar and Natalia Luis, needed help growing their family-owned business. By being a certified business, you know that you are in a group uh, of business owners and in a group of business leaders, among a group of business leaders. 
they are willing and happy to reach out and, and help you and guide you. Sedalia and Natalia became co-owners of the family road construction business in 2008. We obviously entered into the industry uh, um, as leaders of this company uh, at the start of what was an extremely difficult recession. And so the challenges have been instrumental. They've been um, large, but we've overcome them one by one. They turned the 28-year-old firm into a $60 million a year enterprise. Government contracts were key to expansion, making their certification invaluable. Until recently, construction was one field where the number of women-owned businesses was small and never seemed to rise. The federal mandates for certain industries that are not accustomed to seeing women in leadership roles to really open up a gateway for the women to get in leadership roles, but it's by their own device, their own hard work uh, that women can stay in these roles. It is not as a favor to their gender. <laughs> so Megan Byer, 20, you know, almost 20, 30 years and, um, I'm sorry, almost 20 years and we're still at 4% and they, you know, we can't even get 5% of yeah, government yeah. contracts subcontracted out to women-owned businesses. Well, you know, you look at the Department of Treasury is something like 15 percent, and then you've got energy, which is barely over 1 percent. So you have some good guys and some bad guys. But sometimes, you know, I was on the board of the community colleges in Virginia. We had 23 colleges. We always had building projects. And Governor Warner of Virginia... Now had, senator. Now senator. Uh, he had just been, he had just left office as governor, but had a very strong mandate to beef up the women, the contracts that women get. And I said, I want to see a report. How, how are we doing? And they said, well, there aren't any women-owned construction firms in Virginia. And so we, we don't have any. And that was it. That was the end of the day. But what WeBank is doing helps government entities and corporations be able to uh, let a contract out based on subcontractors because they're able to say, you know, these subcontractors are certifiable, women-owned businesses, and even though this corporation that you're letting the contract to may not be women-owned, they're using two, three tiers of, their, your money will be flowing down to those subcontractors. So that's one way of at least making sure that we're growing these smaller businesses to become the prime contractor next time. Yeah, no, and, and I, to your point, Bonnie, the whole word certification not only puts people to sleep half the time, we can't even pronounce, I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> but I, I do think that part of, the, part of the challenge is that there are some of the requirements uh, that lead to the certification are fairly stringent, particularly because women don't have access to capital the way that you have to have had a thriving uh, business for two years. You have to have reached a certain level of revenues. Um, and oftentimes you have a great idea, but people don't want to give you uh, either as a subcontractor or even as a third tier contractor because of the lack of access uh, to capital that, that gets in the way. That's a serious problem. It's a serious problem for women. It's a serious problem also for minority-owned businesses. Yeah. They have this, we have the same issues as well, and God knows if you're the double round me, a black woman or a woman of color, it's especially difficult. Now, there really needs to be a lot more effort put in to make sure that every sort of T is crossed to determine where can we find these these subcontractees because I'm telling you those businesses ex exist yes and it's wonderful when you do find organizations that can link the two together and, and what I love about this is 250 of the fortune 500 are signed up so that to me says the the companies that are going to be letting these contracts they are eager to do it and so you know to me I'll take that as half a loaf um, certification I think is becoming much more uh, in demand because right now I just feel like we're on a tipping point where business is getting that women-owned businesses mean profit for them. And there's a company called uh, Edge Certification that's now going into multinationals mm -hmm. and actually certifying them as a gender-friendly place to be. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that certification is being used to advance women. Well, I, I, I would question whether f federal contracting is a mark of, it should be our greatest indicator of success for women-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. A lot of women own small companies that meet their needs, that are their vision for how to succeed. That's the kind of thing we should be uh, applauding. Well, agreed, but the problem is that when you're starting a 
small business and you want to grow it quickly, there's no quicker way than a federal contract because they're so lucrative. But before we close, one more thing. To the contrary sends a hug and a high five to Malala Yousafzai, the astoundingly gifted Pakistani teenager who last week delivered a memorable address to the United Nations. This week she received a bizarre letter from a senior Taliban commander. Adnan Rashid claimed the Taliban didn't shoot her in the head last year because she crusades for girls' education in Pakistan, but because she said bad things about the Taliban. Whatever. We want Malala to know she is the crown jewel in the fight for girls' and women's rights, not just in Islamic countries, but worldwide. That's it for this edition of To the Contrary. Please follow me on Twitter at Bonnie Urbay and at To the Contrary. And visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary, where the discussion continues. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. I can't, you know, the guy, I mean, why can't we kill this? <laughs> <laughs> that was so great to end the show. Uh, yeah, good I know. Idea. Yeah. If you can do that every week, I'm going to go to great show. Uh, <laughs> Funding for To the Contrary provided by the Cornell Douglas Foundation committed to encouraging stewardship of the environment, land conservation, watershed protection, and eliminating harmful chemicals. Additional funding provided by the Colcom Foundation, the Wallace Genetic Foundation, the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, and by the Charles A. Fruoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at www.pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.